our last bill is Senate Bill 5658. Thank you again, Alia Kennedy, staff to the committee. Senate Bill 5658 eliminates the tax exemptions on precious metal and monetized bullion. Precious metal bullion or monetized bullion is currently exempt from both sales and use and business and occupation tax. For business and occupation tax purposes, tax is paid on the seller's commission from the transaction, but not on gross receipts. Amounts received for commission are taxed at the business and occupation service services activity rate of 1.5%. Precious metal bullion is any precious metal that has been put through a process of smelting or refining, such as gold, silver, or platinum, and in which the value depends on its contents and not in its form. Monetized bullion and co or coins or other forms of mon money manufactured from gold, silver, or other metals and used as a medium of exchange. The definitions do not include metals used for jewelry or works of art. The bill before you repeals the business and occupation and sales and use tax exemption for the sales of precious metal and monetized bullion, effective October 1, 2019. Repealing the tax exemption results in about $10.4 million in general fund revenues over the four year. There are also one-time expenditures of about 10,000 uh, this biennium. I'm happy to answer any questions. We have we have seven people signed in wishing to testify. Senator Palumbo. Thank you. Uh, is there any, you may not know the answer, is there any history? Why do we have this tax preference? Like, why does this industry get a tax preference? What was the, what was the rationale behind it? So I believe the tax preference was enacted in 1985. So there wasn't a public policy objective provided by the legislature. JLARC inferred that the public policy objective was to um, give in-state um, retailers of uh, precious metal bullion a competitive advantage um, as to out-of-state. Senator Hunt, would you like to speak to your bill? Thank you, and, Madam and Chair. And maybe answer Senator Palumbo's question. Yes, the answer to your question is there was a senator who was a gold bullion dealer. <laughs> a guy named Ray Moore from Seattle who uh, convinced the legislature that it was a good idea to exempt gold bullion. That's all I really remember, but it was, it was he who pushed that through and, and advocated for it. And uh, I think it's time, you know, we, we have hundreds of tax exemptions on the book and books and with the Wayfair decision on sales tax that uh, we've recently seen and with the need to, uh, I think, reduce the number of exemptions in our sales and B&O taxes, I bring this forward for consideration. Okay, we will open the public hearing on Senate Bill 5658. The first three people we have signed in to testify are Jason O'Brien, Dan Duncan, and Karen Feldman. Hi, good evening. My name is Jason O'Brien. I'm general manager of local business Bellevue Rare Coins, testifying on their behalf. Um, just give, and for the record, we strongly oppose Senate Bill 5658. Uh, I'll just give you a quick, brief history of our business and our path and where we're at today. Um, Bellevue Rare Coins was started in 1979 in West Seattle, one location. Uh, fast forward to 2010, 2011, we were able to open our second location in Bellevue. And uh, today we have now just opened our fifth location uh, in Tacoma. We have locations in Bellevue, Linwood, West Seattle, Issaquah, and like I said, now Tacoma. We have just over 40 employees now. Um, our growth in large part is due to our bullion sales and that revenue category, that revenue stream for us. Uh, it's predicated, though, on an incredibly high volume. Uh, we have very low margins. Uh, our margins operate 1% to 3%, as is as, as common with everyone in our category. Um, the price of gold is set like a stock on a national market, and that's why it has to be so competitive. That's how it works that way. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, I think there's a stigma around the bullion market where people think it's a, a fat cat category, and, and that's simply just not the case. It's an opportunity for people to invest uh, in precious metals, and there are opportunities for people who are on the wealthier end of the spectrum that can take advantage of stocks, uh, IRAs, that are available to them where they don't pay these penalties that are being proposed. Um, this is really, really going to hurt our business and, in, a, in effect, drive us out of this category. You have states bordering us in Oregon and Idaho 
that do not have these sales tax. Um, if you, for example, quick math, you're selling an ounce of gold based on the market price for $1,000. Um, that tax brings it up to $1,100. Um, there's no way you're going to realize the profit or the gain on that investment. Uh, of You're already at a detriment of $100 on that investment right out of the gates. You're going to push people to Oregon and Idaho to go buy their gold and silver. Uh, I see that my time's up. Unfortunately, I had a lot more I'd like to share with you guys, um, yeah, but I'm going to pass it on to our fellow folks. Thank you. My name is Dan Duncan. I'm here representing Pinnacle Rarities, a rare coin company here in town, um, as well as the Industry Council for Tangible Assets, a national organization. Um, in the in the wake of that Wayfair decision, there have been a lot of moves to simplify codes, to make it easier for tax to receive the revenue from out-of-state um, uh, retailers coming into our state. Um, however, the movement across the country is to in, instill or install these sorts of uh, exemptions um, because the, uh, the bullion is sold as an investment we currently tax, uh, pay B&O tax based on the commissions we make on our bullion sales as a stockbroker pays on their commissions on a stock sale. Um, the um, other states surrounding us all have similar exemptions. Two states are voting this week to continue this thing. In a, in a email from Sam Hunt, who was gracious enough to um, respond to me, he mentioned that 30 states currently charge a tax. That information is, in fact, incorrect. Only 15 states currently have that. Um, I do have a list here. Unfortunately, I didn't make 30 copies, but I can forward you the list of the states and their, all of their tax exemptions. Over 36 states currently have sales tax exemptions for golden bullion. We do pay tax. We pay the B&O rate on the commissions of our sales as opposed to taxing our product as a good. I appreciate your time and thank you very much for letting me speak. Hello, my name is Karen Feldman. I own Tacoma Mall Boulevard Coin and Stamp located at 5225 Tacoma Mall Boulevard. This store has uh, been a second generation family owned business for over 40 years. I have four hardworking employees that love their jobs and each has their own area of expertise. I've built the business enough to provide medical and dental for all of us within the last two years. I want to continue to offer these benefits and stay in business. I oppose 5658 because bullion and related products are an investment much like stocks and bonds and should be treated as such. This exemption has allowed our industry to compete nationally along with 36 other states, which was already mentioned, that maintain exemptions just like ours. We need to stay competitive with surrounding tax-free states such as Oregon and Idaho. Our residents will be forced to buy in these states. They are a short drive away. This was the situation before 1985 when we were granted our exemption. Bullion items are not consumer goods that are used in everyday life. They are products that are purchased for ultimate resale and not any consumer use. These investments are also subject to capital gains tax when sold. If sales tax were to be imposed, the purchaser would be paying at the front end and the back end. Sales tax on these investments would be an immediate investment penalty, thus causing our customers to seek out vendors in other states. Repeal of our exemption will cause loss of revenue, not gain. Our store also sells many taxable items such as jewelry, coin, and stamp supplies, candles, tokens, medallions, even scarves and purses. We are contributing tax revenue in these areas. The truth is bullion is our bread and butter and we can't afford to have our loyal customers cross state lines for their investment needs. The state would also lose the possibility of hosting national coin conventions. These conventions allow our state to gain revenue from hotel stays and restaurant frequency by out-of-state dealers and collectors. If we don't remain tax-free, they will not visit here. A repeal would deny any growth. It would cause many businesses to close their doors. Sadly, there would be a great loss of state jobs. Let's not let this happen. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Clay Hill, Government Affairs Director for Tax and Fiscal Policy for the Association of Washington Business. Thank you for your kind attention to this important uh, policy today. Um, this is a policy that's working. 
1985, you had a handful of businesses that were coin and bullion dealers. As was mentioned, Idaho and, and Oregon don't have uh, sales tax on these products. So we were among the states that went to um, not having sales tax on them. And now there are 38 states that don't have sales tax on uh, gold and bullion or coins and bullion. Uh, that's, a, that's a policy that's working. There are now over 100 uh, local dealers that are listed in the uh, Numismatic Dealers Association, and uh, the fiscal note says that more than 60 would be impacted by this uh, policy. So we've grown the, um, the, the, the policy has worked. You've, you've grown your, your store of local businesses, and was mentioned, um, they do uh, have a lot of product that they sell that is subject to sales tax. Current tax law is fair, and that's the key thing, uh, Senator Palumbo. This is called a tax preference and listed amongst the tax preferences, but current tax law is fair. This is about treating sellers of tangible assets the same as sellers of intangible assets, um, investment products. Uh, there's a 2012 JLARC study on, on this tax preference that mentions this product is meant to be taxed uh, the same way that sellers of stocks and securities are taxed. And that's what you have, a commission, uh, B&O paid on the commission. So I see I'm out of time, but I've uh, provided a handout with the list, full list of uh, all of our points. Thank you. Senator Palumbo. Yeah, Clay, I appreciate that. I, I just have a real struggle understanding how the B&O is fair with 600, what is it, 850 exemptions? Because my small business that has nine employees that I built from scratch and didn't make money for for four years and provide health care for my people pays 1.5%, and I don't get any breaks. That's what these folks pay is 1.5%. They're taxed as service, and the, the issue is whether you would tax them at 471 and put a sales tax on their product, which is not a consumer good, it's an investment asset. As we say, it's not a consumable uh, or, a, or a toy or something like this, it's an investment product. So none of us would go out and buy a, a stock or something and, and pay a 10% markup on, on the stock, um, or, or you know, in this case, buy, buy a bar of gold, as was mentioned, that's uh, worth $1,000, but you have to pay $1,100 for something that's worth 1000 uh, it's just too, I think you would really see people put out of business if you went to a retail sales tax type situation. So this is a really more of a tax structure type choice. How should they be taxed? Should they be taxed as a service business on commissions or should it be a resale taxable type good? And I think it's in the investment category so you get tax parity here. Thank you. Um, Senator Billick. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify maybe for staff. So I think Clay just said that they pay the one and a half percent um, service BNO, but the bill report says that they're exempt from BNO. Which can you clarify? So they only pay the 1.5 servicing rate on the commission made from the transaction, so, right. and the commission is only when they're acting as a, a third party um, seller. Right. So they are exempt from the BNO, not paying the 1.5 on the actual sale of the product. Yes, but for this exemption, they would be taxed either under the retailing or the wholesale rate. Okay, thank you. For, for everything but the commission. The commission would continue. At 1.5? Yes. Okay, thank you. Senator Becker? Um, thank you. So um, you did bring up the B&O um, tax and, the, and JLARC, and I was on JLARC in 2012, and it seems to me, if, if my memory is serving me right, that they did recommend that we continue with this um, with this exemption, and um, I, my question then to staff, um, has there been another JLARC review that said, that changed their findings from 2012 between then and now? Senator Becker, I can answer that. I, I have looked at that report. They recommended- Actually, Clay, let's let Alia um, have the first stab at it. Okay. There has not been an updated report. And JLARC's recommendation was to review and, and clarify. <coughs> review and clarify. And one of the issues is they, they didn't recommend that you should go back to taxing them at retail, which is what repeal does. They said if you wanted to review and clarify anything to get to full uh, parity with securities dealers, they said you're, you're taxing the, or you're applying the BNO 1.5 on commission, but you're missing a, a point, applying the 1.5% on a little bit of markup. There's some difference between markup and commission. But they still wanted to tax at 1.5, the service rate. Uh, if, you, if, if the legislature's goal, a goal was tax parity between investments in tangible assets and intangible assets, uh, there was a little bit of 
they wanted you to make that choice, that policy choice. Okay, um, Senator Hunt wanted to ask a question, but I want to remind members we have three more people signed in to testify. Couldn't so, you make the argument about anything we sell in Washington State that it would be cheaper in Oregon if there was not a sales tax? I mean, that, you know, that's something we hear all the time, refrigerators or, or various other things. So I don't see what, you know, what the difference is, frankly. In all respect, Senator, it's uh, the difference is uh, gold and bullion is an investment product, not a consumer good. Okay, Senator Frocht? How many bullion dealers are, do we have in the state? So the data I have uh, had over 110. That's a numismatic dealers association um, manual or a, sort of like a, a directory. Right, and you said there are 38 states that do not have any um, sales tax or anything comparable to B&O tax on this product. That's right. So, but there, so does that mean there are 12 or 12 who do? That's that's my understanding. Yeah. Senator Arneal. Well, I guess uh, to follow up on that, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the logical uh, finish to your sentence then would be that those 12 states wouldn't have any of these business providers. Uh, so there's that point. And then as a follow-up to that, because uh, a tax, what we're talking about here is actually, if we can sort of flip our minds for a minute, it's money that would otherwise come into the state general fund. And so we have to think about it as quarterly, let's say, that the state writes you a check. And we're trying to figure out if writing you a check and writing your 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 uh, constituents uh, a check, literally, uh, is that you're talking about people with a lot of money, people who have a, have money to invest in the kind of product that you're talking about. Oh, you don't think they have a lot of money? No. Well, okay, well, I chair the Human Services Committee, and I would be very interested in talking with you about the people that we serve in our state who don't have any kind of money like that. So uh, that's just how I have to frame things in my mind, is to recognize that somebody's writing a check. I, w I actually, I, 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 I will let you respond because um, I, I think that's fair. And then I want to move on to the next three people. I appreciate your testimony. You, brought, you all brought some um, interesting information to the table. Thank you. A, a, lot of the, a lot of the investors that begin buying bullion do so because other investments are out of reach. You can buy an ounce of silver for $25. Most of the consumers, by number, are going to buy items under 100 or at, um, at a, the ounce of gold level. Um, small people, small investors will come in and buy a few items a month or one every three months as they can afford. It's the only investment that they can do this with. Stock market, uh, CDs, all of these require a certain amount of capital to get started. Bullion allows small investors, even teenagers, to start putting some of their money in some side of uh, savings as opposed to uh, banks, which require a minimum deposit generally. So a lot of the investors are, in fact, small investors. That's very helpful. Thank you. All right, the next three folks that we have signed up are J.P. Cortez, John Burbank, and Todd Hughes. Thank you, Madam Chair and the committee. Uh, my name is J.P. Cortez, and I'm the policy director for the Sound Money Defense League. Um, there have been a lot of compelling reasons to oppose SB 5658 that have been um, brought up here, and I just want to highlight a few others. Um, so when you, if you were to exchange a dollar for four quarters at a gas station or a grocery store, this is a non-taxable event. You're exchanging one form of money for another. So it doesn't make sense to tax this exchange. But the passage of SB 5658 would make it to where you're taxing money, the only form of money mentioned in the Constitution, the only form of money that has really preserved its purchasing power for thousands of years. So on top of that, the passage of SB 5658 provides major disincentives to investors and people looking to, to save and secure their wealth um, by, being, by 
they know they'll be punitively punished for doing so, for, for protecting their wealth. And so that provides a major disincentive. Also, purchasers of precious metals um, are not consumers. As we know, sales and use tax are passed to the final consumers. But these is hold, this is held as an investment or a currency um, for resale. So another point is that it's a competitive marketplace. And so Washington buyers, like was mentioned earlier, will go out of the state to make sure that they're not getting eaten alive with taxes on this. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Overwhelmingly, the country is trending towards not taxing these. 38 states, as mentioned earlier, uh, have not, uh, do not uh, charge sales tax on it. Tennessee overwhelmingly passed um, a bill out of committee earlier this week. West Virginia uh, overwhelmingly passed, and it's waiting the governor's signature to not tax these metals. Um, and so I appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, you guys allowing me to speak on this, and I urge you to oppose SB 5658. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Todd Hughes, um, Madam Chairman, Senators. I am the president of the Tacoma Lakewood Coin Club. Um, our coin club has been around for 62 years. Um, I am a numismatic investor, so I don't buy gold and silver. I understand the concept, and a lot of my members buy gold and silver because they don't know how to buy stocks and bonds. And like somebody said earlier, they don't have the thousands of dollars to open a CD. And by the way, who wants to go to a bank and open a CD right now anyway? So what little money they have to invest, they, they go buy silver and gold. And uh, it's their way of, I mean, I have a 401k and I have other things, but uh, the, the people that, or in my club don't have a ton of money, so they take and they put their money into this. The tax that um, 38 states don't, and I did the research on that too. And I, you know, um, so as a com more of a common man that ha that deals with the collectors of this type of bullion, uh, I mean, I, I don't believe in 56, 58. I oppose it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is John Burbank. I'm the executive director of the Economic Opportunity Institute, and I'm speaking in favor of Senate Bill 5658. Currently, our tax code excuses precious metal dealers from paying sales and or B&O tax, and this encompasses, encompasses all sales of any precious metal which has been coined, smelted, or refined, including gold and silver. The effect of this exemption is that the purchaser of gold coins pays no sales tax and the dealer pays no B&O. And the fiscal note indicates that the state loses about $3 million a year and local governments lose about a million dollars. In all, there are 60 dealers that benefit from this tax loophole, so that translates to an average windfall of $66,000 each year for each of these dealers. There are no reporting or accountability standards for this preference. It can be inferred that this was simply a favor for dealers in precious metals as they testified in support of this loophole over three decades ago and as you are likely and have heard testimony against this bill today. The current loophole is simply a gift to the wealthy, those who actually buy rare coins and bullion. The result is that if you buy gold bullion like Kruger Rands, you can do that at Bellevue Rare Coins and you pay no sales tax and the retailer pays no B&O tax. Or you can simply go to Pinnacle Retailers or Rarities on Cooper Point Road and buy a 1919 Lincoln Penny for $4,750 and pay no sales tax and no B&O tax, and that's a $500 loss to the public on that one transaction. But if you walk across the street to Macy's and buy an undershirt, you pay sales tax and Macy pays B&O tax. We lose about $3 million every year, and that could actually increase uh, wage increments to 1,500 early child education teachers and caregivers, or fund 300 additional slots in our state's early childhood education assistance program. Senate Bill 5658 eliminates this tax preference for precious metals, enabling enhanced investments in public services for the people of our state. It's a very small step, but an important step in the direction of tax equity and full funding of public services. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Frock has a question for John, you. John, what do you, I'm just, I mean, this is, I've never had this issue come up before us in the Senate, um, and we've talked before. What, what's your response to the gentleman next to you 
to our friends who are behind us. And I'm not, I'm, I'm genuinely just want to know, how do you respond when I say these are not well-off investors? I mean, how do, how, how should we think about this? Because I'm, I'm here with these saying is these are people who are not in, in, who are not into intangible assets. So they don't, hey, they don't want to invest in them or not into them. What's your, how do we think about this? I'm not asking that in a negative way. I just want to get your response so I can understand the frame here. So two things. Uh, I don't think the legislature should be playing uh, winners and losers in terms of the free market. And uh, if we are giving this tremendous tax benefit uh, to precious metal dealers and people who purchase precious metals, the question is, well, how come then if you purchase regular things, you don't get that tax benefit? That's not the free market operating. That's a market that's being um, sort of choreographed by legislative decision. Uh, the second thing is that you look at some of the stuff that's purchased and uh, uh, at these precious dealers, and, and uh, I was serious about this, you know, $1,700 and $50, 1919 Lincoln cent. People don't have, regular people do not have the ability to purchase this sort of thing. They don't have the money. But if we were to take that $3 million and put it into, say, funding uh, ECAP with 300 slots, that money goes into, eventually, into the pockets of the people who are taking care of our kids in ECAP, and they're going to spend okay, it. John, you're repeating your testimony. Great. Thank so, you. <laughs> thank you for answering the question. One last question. So this question is for staff. Um, so as I remember in, in uh, Jay Lark, and that's been a long time ago now for that committee, but it seems to me that the bullion and investments were in this together. So, um, an, in, an investment into your retirement, et cetera. Am I wrong or right? And can you clarify what J. Lark said again? So the J. Lark finding for this, this uh, tax loophole. Um, if you want to call it a loophole, was to review it, whatnot. But what all was included? It wasn't just bullion. It was investment. Um, I, I have that information here. Let me see if I can find it quickly. If not, how about in the interest of time that you email that to all of us? I can do that. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that um, closes our public hearing, and this meeting is adjourned.